obviously you played a whole year earlier than me. It should have been your senior year in high school. I think when I think back on that, I think about the mistakes I made. I think about all the different things I wish I would have known. You being essentially a senior in high school, did you feel like there was a lot of trial by fire? That is all it was. What is an NFL quarterback room like? So two years ago, I trained Sam Darnold and Josh Allen and Kyle Allen. That was my draft class. I think that this league is filled with opportunities and the guys that, that stay in the league for a long time are the guys that take advantage of those opportunities. I'm just a big believer in repetition. I'm a big team guy and goals never end. I'm just a big, 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 big team guy and goals Once I stepped on that field today, I was good, man. All right. Welcome to The Room, episode two. We're really excited. If you didn't watch the first episode, this is me. My name's Kyle Allen. Um, right now with the Houston Texans, formerly with Washington, formerly with the Panthers, formerly with two colleges, played football my whole life. Um, co-host, Jordan Palmer. I've known Jordan Palmer since I was 16 in high school. Um, Jordan's been training quarterbacks forever. Jordan, you can introduce yeah. yourself. Uh, I played on seven teams. Um, and it's actually like, when you meet a, a regular fan, football fan, they go, wow, congrats, seven teams? No, that <laughs> means six people fired me. Uh, but yeah. I played on seven teams. Um, I didn't play on any of the teams that you played on. Actually, I did. I was drafted by Washington. Washington. Yeah. Uh, uh, and uh, I played at, at UTEP before that. It's only started really my senior year in high school. Um, it was really the only year I ever played quarterback, but I was fortunate enough to be around some of the best quarterback development, Elite 11 since it started. My older brother, Carson Palmer, uh, still to this day, probably the best example I've seen of how to do it right, how to be a franchise guy. So been training quarterbacks, like Kyle said, my whole life. And, you know, we, I've been working with Kyle since he was a puppy. And I think what we wanted to create here is it's the room. I, I just think that the QB room, one, it's the most important room in the building. You can get by with a bad GM if you got a great quarterback room, right? You can get by with these other things. If the quarterback room's straight, usually you got a chance. And, um, but it's not just what's talked about X's and O's watching tape. It's kind of like the 20 minutes before the meeting starts and the 10 minutes where you're hanging out afterwards. The QB room, it's like a sacred spot. And it's where the most fascinating conversations, most high-level conversations in football happen. And we wanted to bring that to you. We've got a very special guest today. Desmond Ritter joined us for episode one last week. we got some bangers coming up uh, in the weeks ahead. Uh, but we want to bring the best quarterback from the biggest matchup uh, every single week and not in a, uh, where they talk about the O line and give the politically correct responses. We're going to talk about what you talk about in the room. We're going to do that with our guest today, JT Daniels from West Virginia, who's got a monster year ahead of him. And, uh, we're excited to share this with you guys. So let's get into that first segment, Kyle. All right. So the first segment we got, we're always going to start our show off with this. This is what you start your show off as a, or you start your game off with the offensive coordinator, the quarterback, the opening drive coaches script. First 15 to 20 plays are usually scripted in each game. You know what's coming. We got a bunch of topics from around the NFL, from around different sports. Um, and we want to give our takes and what we think on them. So let's get right into it. So the first topic, um, we haven't seen this yet. This is from our producer, Jake. Um, all it says is who is deciding to make these graphics? So let's see what we got here. <laughs> that's great this go back to the first one these two. Jake, go to these first please. ones this is awesome the first one. find these jake kyle allen this tested is, positive for covid19 and will miss the preseason opener this is like two two three weeks ago how you feeling bro this is this is recent yeah thank you for your concern over this i feel great i feel fantastic i appreciate so it somebody, so somebody like took it they took a, <clears throat> the picture with like the flags which is probably cheerleaders running carrying the flags and then are you? I don't think that's that's it's a yellow Nike sign. That's, yeah, that's a, that's Washington. a Washington hoodie. Then they put the because that's babyface Allen. That you're more neckbeard Allen now, and I'm and then they neck. put the Texans logo on the chest. They change the Stay graphic on the, on the hat, and then they get the little Blake Bortles tongue out the side when you're throwing <laughs> like Michael Jordan tongue. Maybe not Blake. Yeah, Bortles Michael, tongue. No, it's Blake Bortles. Blake Bortles. Uh, <laughs> fun trivia fact: has never thrown a football without his tongue out to the side. Um, that's a bad one. Go to the other one. Out indefinitely. So this, is, this is my <laughs> number one favorite NFL picture of all time. This just came out 
early in Sam's career, I don't think I've ever laughed so hard at something. Just the fact that it says mononucleosis, no one ever calls it that, it's mono, and that he's pointing at every single person in America on Monday Night Football that's watching that <laughs> saying, it could be you. So shout out to Sam. He recovered from mononucleosis two years ago. That was yeah. a hilarious yeah. picture. And by the way, if you shave right there, like just the chin, like – that's that's Wolverine. That's Logan. That comb over <laughs> with that flare on top and a little bit of so burgundy funny. in it. Like he's so Logan from X Men. I love it. It's Sam, so one of our uh, Sam will be a guest at some point this year, and and uh, one of our best friends for sure. Uh, who I, I I can't pick a winner there, but if I did have to pick one, it is definitely you could have mono. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus, that's, that's nice. awesome. All right, week zero in college football starts this weekend. Here's the biggest matchups. We got Northwestern Nebraska, and they're playing in Dublin, Ireland. Let's start there for a second because I've been to Ireland a couple of times, and people don't realize how amazing that place is. I can't imagine. So when I went to I went to, to Ireland on two different occasions, both of them like 10-day trips, and they have Gaelic rules football there, okay? So rugby is – created off of Gaelic rules football, okay? Football is kind of created off of rugby. So really the origin of football, people don't realize, like it's kind of like goes back to, to Ireland. And they play Gaelic rules, and there's five different counties. There's County Cork, uh, County Dublin, County uh, uh, Kerry. They call them county first. And these are like the dude's a mechanic, but he's like the starting whatever, right? And like very few of these guys are pros. And when you drive around Ireland when the tournament's going on, like every town you go through – Everybody just makes sign and just they, like one person's house will just they'll put 25 signs in the front yard. Go, boys. We with you. We support you. It is the coolest thing. And uh, I actually tried to get tickets. It was a championship and it was County Cork playing Dublin at the stadium where Nebraska and Northwestern's playing. And when I asked people how I buy tickets, I asked like five or six different people. And every single person responded by busting up laughing in my face. Like because these because tickets aren't for sale. Yeah. No, like no one will sell the ticket to you. Like, well, what if I give them like a ton, like a couple hundred bucks? They laughed. <laughs> these tickets are so hard to get. Nobody would sell you a ticket. Do you think those guys that played for that team were like superstars in their town when it wasn't yes. football season? Yes. They're all like really well known and, and it's different. You kick the ball, you gotta run with it, you can only take five steps. I don't know. It's really cool. So I'm excited to see. I know uh, like Notre Dame's played there before. Um, I'm excited to see, I want to watch that game, um, more so than the Northwestern Nebraska thing. I want to watch that game. Cause that's just going to be a sick spot to like kick off the football season in. Yeah, that's great. I don't think they've played there before. I remember people playing in Australia recently, but never in Ireland. So that's going to be awesome. They probably won't have as many fans as those Gaelic rules footballs that you were, you were talking about. Um, Week zero is always weird to me, you know. I feel like there's always one big game, and then there's a lot of games that are kind of like, eh, you know. You know, we've got Wyoming at Illinois. Not to hate on UTEP, North Texas at UTEP. Your former. Well, hold on, UTEP's re- UTEP's rebuilding, and I I got word because Cade McNamara at Michigan. He's got right. two little brothers. They're both at UTEP, and I literally was talking to uh, their dad uh, earlier this week, and um, sounds like for the first time in a long time. UTEP's damn near ready to sell out and they haven't sold out really since, you know, way back. Um, so I think that's going to be a good opportunity for UTEP who's rebuilding. Not, not a national story or anything like that, but week zero, if you're looking at these matchups, I mean, people are just so excited to watch football again, you know, um, that, uh, I think that's gonna be a good one to watch too. Yeah. It could be super interesting. I just feel it's just like a teaser almost, you know, you just, you're just waiting for a little bit. There's usually one big matchup that kind of holds you over, I guess, the Northwestern Nebraska one, that's going to be a solid matchup. And then, yeah, another one we got is Vanderbilt at Hawaii. Um, Jordan, you played there in college. Um, I actually played a bowl game in Hawaii. I don't know. I'm remembering that. What was your experience like there? Man, it's a huge advantage when they're at home, and it's a huge disadvantage to Hawaii when they're on the road because you got to travel. I mean, from El Paso, it was, you know, three hours to L.A., layover, and, uh, and then five and a half to Hawaii. You got about a five-hour time change you know, from where we were on mountain or central, whatever it was. And so, cause they're three hours ahead of Pacific. So in fact, episode one, I recorded from Hawaii this year with Des a couple of weeks ago. And uh, so, yeah, it's, it's actually a huge advantage for Hawaii. Now I don't know the state of Hawaii football program right now, but they usually grip it and rip it. 
And uh, Vanderbilt struggles in the SEC, but they still get SEC guys. So uh, that's actually an interesting matchup. Again, just because it's week zero and I'm fired up to watch football, uh, I'm probably going to end up watching all those games. No. Yeah, I probably will too. Not going to lie. Um, speaking of college football, we're seeing this offseason a ton of teams that are talking about um, repositioning in different conferences or actually have repositioned in different conferences. There's another rumor coming out, Oregon to the Big Ten. It says Oregon has initiated preliminary discussions with the Big Ten in Chicago to determine if the Ducks are compatible in the conference. I have a lot of mixed opinions on this. I don't know how I feel about it. I'm still trying to figure out because so many different teams are going to so many different places. You saw the USC, UCLA are going to the Big Ten as well. And what I, when you put it on the map, I think there was a graphic. We could probably throw it on here. There's a graphic that says the Big Ten Conference, right? And it has USC down here in UCLA. And when they have to go play Rutgers in New York, it's six hours away in a flight. And I just think when you think about college football, you're thinking about – rivalry you're thinking about crosstown rivalry you're thinking about you know regional rivalry what do you think is going to come of all of these different these different teams going to these random conferences i think it's gonna be awesome <clears throat> i mean it comes down to do you have enough money as a program whether it's your collectives or whatever to support recruiting against the people that you're playing on a regular basis right i would argue that oregon is going to be able to afford that i don't have any inside information but Nike, whatever, I, I'm sure they're going to be able to compete. They certainly are when it comes to facilities and uniforms, right? So UCLA is the one where I go, you know, can they, can they, can they compete? Can they recruit like that? Can they, you know, generate enough, you know, money to get, you know, the top players there? Do you think UCLA benefits more from being in the Big Ten than being in the Pac-12? I, I think it's going to, it's going to nudge their, their alumni and it's going to nudge that, uh, like the whole kind of football or, you know, program as a whole to say, Hey, look, we've been struggling in the pac 12. Like you're playing a bunch of teams that are better than the best team in the pac 12. You know what I mean? Like you put, you put Penn state the last five years, they're not even, they haven't even won the, the big 10 championship. You put them in the pac 12 in the last five years. I bet they win that thing three or four times. Right. Mm -hmm. And so just in the last five years. So I think it's going to nudge the programs that can get there. Like, I don't think Utah, could ever get to a place where they can recruit against Ohio state. But I think Oregon can, yeah. I think USC yeah. can and UCLA should be able to, we, you, you've thrown there. UCLA's facilities are dumb. unbelievable. They They're don't dumb. even need to recruit. They don't need to recruit because you go there on a day in, in July in the off season and there will be ever, any superstar you can think of from any NFL team working out there. All you got to do is say, Hey, just come out, come out July 15th um, and just walk around. I won't even say a word to you. Look at who's out there. I mean, Dude, I stayed out there we one went. summer. Yeah, we threw that one day. I stayed one summer and trained in L.A. with me and Christian Kirk rented a house there, and we were training out at UCLA. And every day, it's Odell there, Russell Wilson's there, Vaughn Miller's there, you know, Tom Brady's in and out of there, Saquon Barkley was there. It's unbelievable. Yeah, I went one day last year, went the day before the Super Bowl in February, met up with Joe the day before the game. The Bengals were staying at the team hotel at UCLA right there, right, the day before the Super Bowl in L.A., and... I, I run into a bunch of the Bengals, right? So I'm talking to CJ Uzoma and, and T Higgins. And I've been around T Higgins. T Higgins was a receiver on my seven on seven team at the Nike opening when he was a high school kid. Uh, and I helped him out during the draft and stuff. And T made a point to me. He's like, we were talking about, dude, how crazy are these facilities. And by the way, it's like my draft guy's throwing. Will Levis jumped in the group. He's got a chance to be the number one pick this year. Aiden Hutchinson's running the 40 over there, right? And you kind of look around and that was just a random day. And T made a good point. He's like, dude, how crazy are these facilities? And keep in mind, T at, was at Clemson, which arguably has some of the best facilities in the country. And he's like, between the weather and the facilities and the amount of stuff to do, he goes, these guys should either be a national powerhouse or it's going to be hard for them to ever be good because you could get real soft if it's this cushy all the time and perfect weather. Well, yeah, so it's going to go one of two ways. Yeah, and I think like it's it's just tough in LA, man. Especially where they are in Westwood in LA. Like it's you cannot recreate like South Carolina, Clemson, like grit practicing in the heat in July and August. I mean So we we have a we have a coach here, our O C that always says it, and I hate it when he says it because I've spent every day in the heat for the last month, but he always says in the morning practice when we know it's gonna be hot, he says, You have the opportunity today to go practice in this heat in this tough weather to make yourself tougher than the other guys. 
Mm. The Dallas Cowboys are, are practicing in California right now. They're not practicing in this heat. And I hate it when he says it because I know in 10 minutes I got to go out there and actually do it. But he's he's right. You just there's nothing that you can recreate when you're in L.A. I mean, we played in L.A. this week. The stadium's a dome, but it's open and you can feel the breeze coming through there. And it's beautiful. Like you, I felt like I was in a hotel room, you know. Yeah. So, so I think there there is something to that. I went to your game, balled out, by the way, nine for Thank 12 with two, with two drop touchdowns. I'll say it. You won't. Um, but uh, yeah, my, my little guy and I, Ford and I went to your game to watch you play and we both brought a sweatshirt. Got a little yeah. nippy at night. You know, it was like, it was like perfect. Yeah. Yeah. I'm with great. you. All right. Keep this drive moving along. Uh, LSU, interesting quarterback room. I mean, you've got a couple of dudes. You've got Brad Johnson's son who's there. You've got uh, Walker Howard, Elite 11 kid. The year before, you got Jaden Daniels who transferred in. And then you've got Miles Brennan who's been there since his fifth year. He got hurt last year. Um, Miles Brennan decides to step away. I was at the Manning camp this summer, and all four of those guys came to throw one day. And you're sitting here like, man, this is four college football starters in one room. It's interesting. Um, guys that have all started or, or, or are going to start a lot of games. Um, so Miles Brennan steps away. One, I was pretty surprised by that. But two, um, he had signed some NIL deals and he keeps the money. And he keeps the money because it can't be about your on-field performance. So it's pretty interesting. Um, you know, as, as NIL, it's still a new thing. But we're seeing cause and effects a, across the board. Um but yeah, I thought that was interesting when we saw that this week, and uh, it'll be interesting to see kind of one who ends up being the starter there. I would assume Jaden Daniels. We'll see. Um, but yeah, Miles Brennan being able to, to kind of pocket that cash and move on to the next phase of life. Yeah, and I think you know I, I saw a lot of people upset about it. You know, online, I think people were first of all people were calling him a quitter. People were like, oh, people are saying he retired. No, he quit. You know, I think until you're in that situation. You know, I think had Miles been somewhere before, I think I read somewhere that he had been somewhere before or had been in previous quarterback battles. When I think he was going into his senior year, when you've been through battles and you've been through it all and you just don't, you know, you don't see it. Like maybe he didn't see it going into the NFL, right? I want to enjoy my last year. Like I can respect him for the decision. You know, I understand the decision. I understand how hard it is to play, especially at an SEC school, SEC school like LSU. I respect the decision. And from the, the other side of it, where people are getting upset that he gets to keep the money. I just think about all the years in the past where I didn't get paid. You didn't get paid a cent. Tons of people didn't get paid a cent. So why do we care right now? You know, yeah. let this kid, let this kid get his money. And the way the deals are worked out right now, like you said, it's not about on-field performance. It can't be about on-field performance. The players have the power right now. So to be honest with you, I'm excited to see it work out this way. I think it's good for the game. I think it's, it's good for these players. And I think these companies need to maybe rethink about how they're doing things <clears throat> instead of throwing all this money. Yeah. Speaking of players getting money, uh, Malachi Nelson, we threw with him this off season, um, signing with clutch sports. Now clutch sports founded by LeBron James's business partner, Rich Paul. I feel like they have like all the top NBA players. I don't follow NBA like that, but I just feel like a bunch of dudes are, are signed with and they got a long client list. Um, but Malachi Nelson, he's the first uh, high school football player to sign with Clutch. Um, he's right now committed to USC. You know, he just took a trip to Texas A&M, who apparently has all the money, according to Nick Saban. Um, so, you know, are we going to see more of this? Like, really, an NBA, if you think about the difference between a, a football an NFL football player, let's just say an NFL quarterback and an, and a superstar quarterback and a superstar NBA player. It's just like a different approach, right? Like they're, they're fit. The NBA players, their faces are so much more recognizable. They're also seven feet tall, whatever, but uh, they're so recognizable. The marketing deals are so big. And now with social media, we're kind of taking the helmet off these guys. Like if mm -hmm. Patrick Mahomes walks in any city in America, everybody's going to know who he is. They're going to recognize his face. But way back in the day, they may not have recognized Boomer Esiason. You know what I mean? Outside of Cincinnati or Dan Marino outside of Miami, you know, back in the day. Now we, he's a recognizable face. But with it's interesting seeing Malachi and I've been around Malachi. Boy, does he have a good head on his shoulder and, and he can freaking rip it. And I don't think any of this going to be big, too big for him. I saw this and I, I love it. I, I think it's really interesting. It's outside the box. And here's the thing that nobody's thinking about. He didn't sign a lifetime contract with Clutch Sports. If it doesn't work out, he can fire him and head another route. 
that's one of the things I like with young guys being able to sign with agents is they're not locked at all. It's really just for NIL. And mm-hmm. so you can still go sign with a different football agent to do your contract. You can say, hey, this is great. I'm sticking with them. Or you can say, hey, this is a bad experience. I'm moving on before you even get to the league. But what are your thoughts? I, I completely agree with you. I think if this is the type of money is going to be thrown around and these type of deals are going to be thrown around and – and you just you're just at a young age, right? I think Malachi is what sixteen, seventeen years old. It is just it's prudent of him. It's smart. It's it's. it's I hope his parents were involved in the process too, because it is so smart for him to, especially with Clutch. You know, LeBron James as a business manager. You know, Rich Paul's involved. All these NBA athletes, they've been through it all. They've seen it all. They understand it. They can help these kids through it. And you and you hope that they do right by him. And I, I think they will. But he's going to be so much better for it. They're going to probably send him more deals. He's going to understand the deals better. He's probably going to get financial help out of it, too, from a financial literacy perspective. You know, me and you have talked about this before of how tough it is to get this type of money at a young age. They'll probably help him with that, get him a financial advisor. I think that allowing these agents to come in and recruit the kids, yes, but allowing these kids to sign with agents is going to do nothing but help them in the long run. Yeah. Yeah. Next up, uh, Jordan, you've been a, a part of this as many times. Well, a little more than me, not to rub it in, but you've been a part of Cut Day <laughs> a lot. Um, we were talking about Hard Knocks last time. Everyone's going to be able to see it on Hard Knocks. I think it's always a really revealing and interesting part of Hard Knocks is, is Cut Day. And I think when people think of Cut Day and they see it, you don't really understand how it all goes down. So tell me, I would love to hear your most interesting Cut Day experience. Yeah, I <clears throat> honestly, I've got three completely different cut day stories. Okay, so one of them is I was in Cincinnati, and it was really interesting because my brother was demanding a trade, so it was turbulent. Um, we had the NFL lockouts, 2010, and we drafted Andy Dalton in the second round, and they told me we we're going to draft a quarterback. And I organized all these off season, you know, workouts with the whole team, and uh, decided to help Andy as much as I could, and when it finally came and the owners realized, Hey, Carson's really not coming back. Um, the day before training camp, they signed another quarter veteran quarterback. I've been the two for four years and they signed another veteran quarterback, Bruce Krakowski, shout out to Bruiser. And, and then I, was, I literally didn't get a rep after being the two and it went well, I had three, three years in a row did a really good job. And so the writing was on the wall. I actually asked to be released to get an opportunity to go somewhere else. And, you know, so I'd had that conversation kind of waited and Jim Lippincott, Lippy, he's, uh, you know, go ahead and come in. Coach wants to talk to you, bring your playbook. So that was one where it was kind of on the front end. When I get to Chicago, it was me and Jimmy Clausen battling it out. And I had tore my pec in OTAs. I was the two. They had nobody else. It was me and Cutler. And then I tore my pec in OTAs and they signed Jimmy Clausen. He was coming off a of shoulder surgery. He struggled in spring and then he rehabbed and in, in training camp and through three preseason games, we were basically deadlocked even, but there was still the like, yeah, but is my pet going to tear again? And so Mark Tressman, who's still a very close friend of mine and head coach at the time, you know, he said, Hey, we're, we're going to release you, but there's a team who's going to sign you. And I don't think legally he couldn't tell me. He's like, don't fly home. So once we, cl- once we cut you and you clear waivers to stay in Chicago, so I stayed in Chicago and 48 hours later, I flew to Buffalo to play in that fourth preseason game. So it was kind of like a, like a kind of a hookup, you know what I mean? A chance to go there. Um, and then I've certainly just been straight up cut before. And then another time it was um, in Jacksonville and we were two and 14. So we, were, we didn't know who, if anybody was going to get fired. So the quarterback coach pulls me in and he goes, Hey, if I'm here, you're here. And the coordinator, Bob Ratkowski says, if I'm here, you're here. And the head coach, Mike Malarkey says, if I'm here, you're here. Everybody got fired. <laughs> Every Stop. GM, everybody. The lady that worked at the front desk, everybody got fired. Clean house. And the quarterback coach, Greg Olson, Oli, who's with the Rams now, he goes to Oakland where my brother had just demanded a trade from. So he's like, dude, this is the only team that literally is like, they're so pissed at your brother right now. You ain't coming here. And then the other two guys took a year off. So Fair. I get called in, bring your playbook. And I'm like, homeless and fly home so yeah i've been cut multiple times you know the bring us your playbook thing that happened to me my rookie year um and then i've had just a couple interesting ones where they brought me in for a reason they had to let me go for a reason they tried to give Mm -hmm. me a soft landing spot so yeah it's always unique and i think it's it's funny 
I mean, I guess it's not funny, but you look back on these stories and it, it's funny to sit here and talk about them. I remember I've only been cut once. It was my rookie year. I was undrafted. I didn't really expect to make the team. I didn't play in any preseason game. I played in the second half of the last preseason game was the only time I played. Thankfully, we were down by however many points and we got to throw the ball 35 times in the second half. So I got to show out. I played well. And then the next day they said, hey, we're going to have you on practice squad. So I'm like, great. This is awesome. Like I made practice squad. I called my girlfriend at the time with my fiance. Now I said, hey, come out to Charlotte. Like we're on the team. Like we made it. Like, let's move out here. I bought a used 2015 Ford Escape the next day for like $12,000, probably like half of my bank account. And then I remember at the time I was staying in the hotel because I didn't have an apartment yet. And I get in the hotel and I go out to the elevator to go up to my floor. And it was like a scene out of a movie. I get in the elevator. The elevator's closing. (laughs) All of a sudden, a hand comes in and goes, wait, wait, wait. It opens back up. There's a Carolina Panthers playbook in one arm. And I'm looking down at it. And I look up. And it's Connor Cook. And I know exactly who he was. I looked him in the face. And I and I remember, I would have never said this in normal circumstance, but something came over and I looked at him and go, are you Connor Cook? And he was like, yeah. And I didn't even introduce myself. I was like, all right. <laughs> and I got off on my floor and went to my room and I was like, oh, I'm screwed. And then four days later, it was, you know, the guy that you never want to see that time of year. There's only one guy on the team that comes up to your locker and taps you on the shoulder and says, hey, bring your playbook. Uh, the GM wants to see you. I get the GM comes to see me, says, Hey, sorry, we want to see what uh, this guy has. Uh, we're going to release you. My girlfriend moved out there three days before. We packed all our stuff up, which wasn't much, in my Ford Escape that I just bought, and we drove 30 hours back to Arizona. So it's, it's such an interesting time. So many people are in so many unique scenarios, and it's, it's just weird how people pour so much into this, you know, in a more serious note, you see all these guys through training camp pour so much into this to try and, and make their dreams come true. And it's tough to see guys who you've spent the whole off season with in training camp, just like that. They're not there anymore. Yeah. The energy and anxiety this last week is just nuts going into that game, coming out of the game. Mm -hmm. um, Just, you know, the whole route, you can feel it in the locker room. And unfortunately it's a bunch of guys on the wrong end of it, but it is what it is. We all signed up for it. So, yep. All right, next segment, throw it deep or check it down. I will throw these to you, Kyle. So we're going to go in here, memorable preseason football magazine covers. With no further Mm -hmm. ado, let's get into it. All right, so this first one, Chase Daniels, Mizzou. People don't realize how good they were. What do you think of this magazine cover here? Are you throwing this one deep or are you checking this one down? I'm throwing this one so deep, like as far as I can, just because of Chase Daniels' career to this point. Chase Daniels has had like famously the best career of a backup quarterback of all time. I think he started five games and he's made around $50 million. And it was funny. We were actually, we had just played, we played the Rams and the Chargers played the Rams the week before. So we were watching Chargers offense versus Rams defense. And Chase played, I think, the whole first half, and he was balling out. And we were like, where did Chase go to school? Like, we were trying to remember where he went to school and typed in Chase Daniel on Google on the computer, and it's up on the on the big projector. And it's this picture pulled up, just absolutely peeking at Mizzou. So I'm throwing this one all yeah. the way deep. Yeah, I'm throwing this one deep, too. I'll never forget, I was watching College Game Day on my couch this season, the season we're talking about right here that they're previewing. And, you know, they have the signs behind the, the uh, desk. And somebody, they were playing Texas, and somebody had this up, giant sign, and it just said, Chase Daniels has a fupa. <laughs> and it circled. <laughs> it was one of the funniest signs. And then you see this guy come and grab the sign and take it down. It was like, no. big, right behind Herb Street. Uh, and I, I'll literally never forget that. So funny. Our producer, Jake, threw these together, and I love that this made the list. All right, so we're both throwing this one deep. What do you got next? Ooh, Brady Quinn, Notre Dame. Look at LeBron, Serena, and Snake on a plane. Um, what year was this? 2006? Cool. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, we were the same year. We were the same draft class, 07 draft class. Um, yeah, he just looked like an NFL guy. He was all jacked and handsome, you know? Um, He's just like the just poster like, child, you know? He just, looks, yeah. he just looks like he belongs on a magazine. Yeah, totally. Um, I, I'm checking it down. I've just never been a big Notre Dame guy. I mean, I'm just throwing it deep because he looks like he should be on every magazine ever. 
I, I'll put them on a magazine <laughs> right now. Yeah, true. Oh my gosh. Check down. <sighs> oh, you be one of a kind. That's true. He's Dimension. one of a kind. Um, certainly had some conversations about Russell Wilson in the last few years. Yeah, I'm, I'm checking it down. I think he's one of the best players in this league. I think he's been amazing for a long time, statistically speaking, playing with shorthanded O-line and all that stuff. Um, but, uh, yeah, I'm checking this down. Yeah, I'm just <laughs> checking it down strictly off the fact that they're comparing him to Da Vinci in this picture. That's, that's some nope. lofty praise there. I don't think we can go that far. Nope. Oh my goodness, 97, Vinny Testaverde, you got Jeff Blake, Air McNair is one of my all-time favorites, you got Slash, Cordell Stewart, and then one of my favorite teammates, I was a rookie, uh, Mark Brunel was the veteran, Washington Redskins at the time, and I'd known actually Mark for a long time, ran into family friends, um, yeah, he was the first, not the first, because because. Uh, Steve Young, but I mean, Brunel, lefty running around. We see him on hard knocks now. He's a quarterback coach for Detroit Lions. I love this. I'm throwing this one deep all the day, all day long. I mean, just looking at this cover, I didn't see any of these guys plays, but the, the names on here, you know, just to actually get this right. I mean, we see the Browns one and it's, it's completely wrong. And you see this one and just, just to have all these legends on here. This is, this is an incredible cover. Throwing it deep. Yeah. L- low key. My nephew's 13 Carson Sonny went to IMG Academy this summer. Quarterback coach there, Jeff Blake. Full circle. Wow. That's pretty huge. Yep. Any more? Mm. I'm throwing it deep to Jamar Chase. To any of them. To every of them. Tyler Boyd. I'm throwing it deep to Trent Irwin. Yeah, we are. Yeah. This is as easy as it gets right here, man. What a stud. Yep. Welcome him in. Guest for the week. A guy, Kyle, you and I have known for a long time. Long time. Uh, JT Daniels, West Virginia Mountaineers. JT, how you doing, bro? Good, just hanging out. Uh, you just brought that up. Uh, you, just, you still have the picture of me, Kyle. Um, I can't remember else who was in there, but I was a yeah. seventh grader. I think Kyle was freshman or sophomore at A and M. I'm sure. We, I'm sure yeah. I have that, and we'll pull that up, and it'll probably go right here. Um, Gosh, that was who? That was you guys. I think Deshaun was like going into his sophomore year. That's right. It was Deshaun Watson was out there, um, coming off of ACL at the time. Ben, ben, ben Hicks, Hicks from SMU. If you remember yep. Ben Hicks? Yep. Yep. Probably I Sam. Was, I don't know. Yeah, I know. You were working with Sam private because he was just very important. Oh, it might have been like. Oh, he was way more important to you guys. Maybe like Hackenberg or Goff. No, Sam was in the different group. Probably Hackenberg. Is that a different group? Yeah. No, um, I remember that weekend. Yeah. It wasn't them. It was Deshaun, and it was Ben Hicks, and there was one more. I can't remember who the last one was, but I was taking them all. Oh, it was Stidham. The last one either. Yeah. It was Stidham, it I was, think, at, at No, Baylor. Jared was there, and there was, there was someone else I can't remember. Jared was there. Then you bring it up, but there was somebody else. The I only reason remember. I really remember that weekend is because I took them all to the airport in my dad's, like, little Lexus sedan, and on the way to the airport, my tire popped on the five, and they all had to hail a cab from the – side of the highway <laughs> and i sat on the side of the highway for two hours after that <laughs> so needless to say we go way back i think jt you and i started uh working out together you were probably what seventh grade sixth grade seventh grade yep and then seventh grade yep and then kyle i think you were a sophomore so um another thing too is i remember and kyle you can tell the story but you know kyle was like the top recruit in the country jt was like whatever you are in seventh grade at that time, but like pretty clear that you were going to be a big time recruit telling Kyle, Hey, this JT kid, keep him under your wing. Keep an eye on this kid. Don't let him turn into a punk. Yeah. That was early. Yeah. You were seventh. I think that was the first day I met you. And I remember you were out there seventh or eighth grade and it was me and Deshaun and all those people we were talking about. And then you were out there spinning it just as good, if not better than us. And I did not want to take you under my wing. Cause I was like, this kid's going to beat me out one day. <laughs> it's like, no, I'm good. Uh, yeah. It still could happen. Yeah, good. Um, well, really cool. We're going to dive into some stuff. JT, we're not just going to sit here and talk. Um, you want to get into the teach tape, Kyle? Yeah. Teach tape. Um, just talking about, well, I think when we met was you were in seventh or eighth grade. Um, I think we have a picture, not that picture, but we have a different picture of similar timeline around that area. And I just wanted you to break the picture down for us. Um, it's you. Oh, me and Blake. Blake. <laughs> Who's on the left? Oh, you know? Yeah. 
That's you Nico. Know? Yeah, Nico and I grew up. We played together since we were sixth graders. Um, he's starting at Fresno State now. He he uh, he did all his first, first four years at Cal, um, and then he just transferred to Fresno State. He'll have a big year there. And then yeah, we both we played uh, the same seven on seven team with uh, Blake Barnett, and it's uh, around the same time period. I think I was a seventh grader, and that's when uh, what what, what year was that? Is that twenty fourteen? Four weeks ago, so that's like what eight years ago. No, it says twenty fourteen. So that was oh, it twenty fourteen right yeah. there. What year? What year? What, what year was RG three? Um, and it, what what was RG 3s last year at college? Oh, that's a good trivia question. I don't know. It was either twelve or thirteen. Anyways, I went with the one sleeve because RG three did that, and it was dope. Mm. So I started. It was, and dope. it looks like you're wearing a headband, but that's not a headband. If I remember correctly, you used the rock backwards, the backwards visor. visor. Just the backwards yes. visor. That was the uh, that that was the move. That was. You, you you see any kid in that in seven on seven today? You know where it starts. That's from. that's yeah. swaggy with the RG three reference though. I was wondering where this came from, but yeah, I, I remember him doing that with the old Adidas stuff. That's good. Yeah, yeah. yeah so that's a good look. And so you've come from there, obviously, and now that's eight years ago. Then we go to this next picture of you now, a lot mm. more put together. Smoke. This is your dog. You have a couple dogs, right? I got two dogs, big dog Smoke guy. and Tank. They're twins. Big, big dog guy. Yeah, I'm a huge Looking dog guy. Looking great in the suits. This is like a local suit company out there. Yeah. How do you- I don't think it's. I don't think they were local. Um, Jackson Pierce is the name. I'm not sure where. We yeah, your suit them, game. It was quite. I, I came out and visited in Georgia. Your suit game was put together. I mean, he was three, four weeks down the road laying stuff out. At because at, at Georgia, um, we and we do the same thing here actually. Uh, like we wear a suit to the uh, pregame. So, like, I, I've always been, like, a suit guy, like, fashion and whatnot. So as soon as the NIL, that was the first thing I wanted yeah. with NIL was, uh, was, was, to get, it was to get the suits going. And it was cool. Like, the, pretty much the entire team had the same idea. Um, so that, 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 was, that was actually a really fun part was on Friday. Like, when, when you put on the, uh, right before you go on the bus or the plane if you're away, uh, it was like everyone was showing off what they had for the week. Yeah, that's probably crazy. Yeah, I, like I remember in, in college, we only had the track suits, and we were stoked to be all matching in the track suits. But then even nowadays, I mean, I, I think I have like a three-suit rotation that I've had since my rookie year because I don't want to buy any more suits. So maybe I need to get some more suits from you. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's fun. It's fun. It's a big part of it. It's fun for the Friday. Yeah, it was good. Sure. All right, so that's it for Teach Tape. Um now, first, I want to get into this. Okay, I got some stats here. So, last year with Georgia, you were undefeated in four games, threw for 1,231 yards, 10 touchdowns against two picks. Um, I don't have a question there. I just wanted to remind people the level that you played at. Uh, you don't love talking about stats in yourself. Um, but that, that type of year, that whirlwind, you start off, you play at that level, you get hurt, you're out. Then you ride with – decide to really go all in helping Stetson. They give him the ball. You end up winning a national title. You're on the team. Here comes the question. I, I mean, you've been the starter a lot. You've been hurt before. How wild was last year? I mean, the ups and downs personally and then to end up actually getting a ring at the end. Yeah. Um, it, it was one of, like, the, the common things we talked about on Georgia was, like, we didn't even – we really didn't even think next man up. We didn't care who was in. You know, it was like if uh, – and, like, Co- Coach Smart talked about it all the time. Like, you'd said, like, J.D. goes down. Like, who cares? And, like, the next guy's going to be expected to play, and we don't even think about it. Um, so, to me, I, I you know, I kind of took that to heart, uh, and a lot of the team did. Um, so, I was just – you know, every week I go in preparing to go in play two. And, uh, I, like, I was really just focused on what was going on. It didn't hit me. And, you know, we talk all the time, and we didn't even, like – we talked about all right, how you know, let's be ready to play this weekend. That was, you know, the extent of what what most of it was. Um, it was, and it also helped, you know, having Stet be like such a good friend of mine. Uh, like me and Stet still talk once or twice a week. Uh, we text and send Snapchats, things like that. Um, but uh, you know, it, it goes by so fast, and just the whole team's focus, like that, that it was never a part of it where it was that big of a deal. You know, once the season ends, then you start to obviously consider, you know, what's next, but. During the season, I was uh, every week was just focused on you know being ready to play in the second. Place. Yeah, I feel like that's a thing that a lot of people get wrong about the quarterback room from the outside perspective is that it's a battle, in that it's different from any other position because there's only one guy in there and you're not rotating like a running back or receiver. There's one guy in there and it's your job, and a lot of people get that wrong. 
that there's there's tension and there's animosity in the quarterback room a lot of times. But from my experience and probably similar to both of your guys is your best friends in that room, probably with 90, 95 percent of the guys you're with. You know, you talked about it. Talk, do you have any other guys throughout your career that you've been close with, even at USC in high school or probably the whole quarterback room in Georgia, too? Yeah, I still talk with Vandegrift and Carson from Georgia, um, me, Fink and Sears from my freshman year. At USC, we were all, you know, Fink and I love hanging out with Fink. Me and Sears were good friends. Um, you know, Keaton, I was, we always had a good relationship. I've, uh, there's never been even like Jamie Newman, who was there for, you know, who I was with for a few months at Georgia. I love Jamie. Like Jamie and I were great friends. We had, we shot the shit all the time. Um, I never once have experienced like uh, the what what people assume goes on in the quarterback room. Um, which is that animosity and it's like, you know, the quarterback is, you know, one of the premier positions uh, in all sports. But you, you, would, you would be surprised to be in a quarterback room and see how everybody is like genuinely good friends. Let's, um, that's cool. Let's go back to, to something else that I think nationally uh, a lot of people don't realize. So you played at Modern Day. Uh, I believe your freshman year at Modern Day on varsity, you broke all the school records. Um, and then second and third year balled out. Gatorade Player of the Year, and then Gatorade Male Athlete of the Year, your junior year. Most people don't realize this. You skipped your entire senior year. There's a lot of kids that do in early enrollees, and they skip second semester of their senior year, but they play their senior year. Um, you skipped it outright. Uh, and, and you didn't do what Quinn Ewers did, where you skipped it and then went and enrolled early and sat and watched. You skipped it, and you, and you started at USC following Sam Darnold. Um, looking back on that, I mean, how was that experience? Would you do it? Would you do that again? Did that give you a huge advantage having to get thrown in as a young guy? You know, only three years high school experience. Like, what, as you look back on that, what kind of impact did that make on your career? Um, it's funny because I like I go back and think about it every now and then. Uh, if there's one thing I do wish I had, it was a senior year of high school. Um, you know, this is something you and I talked about, uh, but when I was way, way, way younger was, uh, you know, the older you get, the less football becomes about fun and the more it becomes about, like, that's your business, that's your job, right? Um, and high school football is, like, the most fun football ever is, you know, especially when you're on a really good team that wins every game and everybody's really good. Um, I do wish I got to experience more of a senior year of high school, which I never really got. Uh, in terms of how it impacted my career, like, I don't think it was uh, – I don't think it gave me any sort of advantage or anything at the time. I felt like I had – done what I needed to do in high school. I felt like I was ready to co go to college and ready to be a college quarterback. So that was kind of why we made the decision. But uh, I don't think, like, I don't think staying an extra year would have done anything uh, that would have hurt me or anything. It's not like I look back and regret the decision. Um, but it would have been cool to have, you know, an actual senior year and gone into college, you know, with, with another year of experience. Yeah, it's always interesting. I feel like at least in before you, there wasn't really anybody that did that. You know, I think you were one of the first guys that I noticed that did that in, in kind of my class. And before that, the, the trend was, okay, you play your senior year and then you go skip and then get a whole spring so you can become ready and go more. So I thought that was super interesting. I remember it was, it swept the nation when you did it at first, but um, I think for me, I played young as well. Obviously you played a whole year earlier than me. It should have been your senior year in high school. I think, when I think back on that, I think about the mistakes I made. I think about all the different things I wish I would have known. I wish I would have sat behind maybe someone and, and got to see someone else make some mistakes so I could learn from it. You being essentially a senior in high school, did you feel like there was a lot of trial by fire and trial by error out there and you wish you would have maybe gotten to see someone play before you? That is all it was. Um, was it was it was straight trial by error or trial by fire. Um and it's like I talk, when I talk to, you know, younger quarterbacks, you know, especially like if the high school quarterbacks, they DM me or ask me questions or, you know, I'm at a camp and the kid asks me questions. I always tell them, like, it's probably it's almost more ideal to go <clears throat> sit behind somebody for a year or two. Um, there is so much, especially if like a lot of the older college guys, especially the ones that I know, are more than willing to help and aid with younger guys development. Um, and the guys that are, you know, behind them on the depth chart. Uh, I've always been one of that guy. Like, we, we got a lot of younger guys uh, that are really talented here at West Virginia, um, and guys that are really good guys that ask me a lot of questions and come and watch my weekly film prep and all of that. Um, I think, like, I think it's great for younger guys to, instead of going out and the, the game moves really fast and 
kind of lear learning by uh, learning by fire unless you're you know that Caleb Williams or the, that Bryce Young generational type of guy like I think it's great to go and play with you know somebody that's been through three four years of college that started a lot of games uh, that has a really good understanding of the system and all those things um, uh, that's kind of how I feel yeah all right so let's go back so you played three years in high school, 12,000 passing yards, one of the best programs in the country, maybe arguably the best program in the country. And you were one of the best players really in the last handful of years of, of high school football. Um, how much money would you have made if your senior year was right now in NIL? You'd have to, uh, you'd have to ask the bigger names than me right now to see exactly what that number looks like. Um, I, I don't I don't know what the, the common fans think, but I think it would surprise most on what like a high schooler just leaving high school is offered in terms of like the, the amount of deals they get um, for like national big brand big name deals to um, you know go represent that brand. Do you think? Yeah. Do you think? Uh, I mean, go ahead, George. Kyle, real quick, we we threw this off season with somebody who has already made one million dollars. And is just starting his senior year in high school. Yeah, I mean, it's crazy. It's oh, it's sure. crazy, and I'm always interested in looking at this because they throw around crazy numbers. And it's nil. It's early. It's the wild west. You don't know if any of these are true, but your opinion? Do you think that the high school kids coming out getting recruited by these colleges are getting bigger deals than the kids that are already in college now? With what you just said, yeah, like <laughs> absolutely. And I, I mean, like, to a certain extent, it makes sense, right? Um, a lot of the NIL, like there are plenty of deals that are um, obviously not like somebody's just paying you to go play football there at a certain school, but it's, you know, people that are, have either went to a certain school or uh, that, that, are, that own a business that were, you know, in, in any way fans of the school that are more inclined to pay someone to get them there than probably to keep them there. Uh, you know, if you are like, if I'm already at a certain school, they don't need, I don't think they need to pay you as much, right? Like they wouldn't think they need to pay you as much as maybe the next five star. That's going to be the best wide receiver in the country mm -hmm. in two years. Um, I, 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 I definitely see it as a, like a, a recruiting tool. When you start to see like the more absurd offers, I, I would assume those most commonly come in, in <laughs> some, some way, re, you know, recruitment. Do you think it's good for college football or no? Yeah, um, personally, I do. Just, I, I like. I think it. Uh, it, it makes things at least more public. Like it's. It's not like those things never happened before, um, and now it's something that is legal and technically every school can compete uh, in, in that in that market um, in some way or another without breaking a rule, uh, with that, without you know r r risking going behind the table to do. Yeah, anything. one more thing on this. I think we we talk about it because it's really interesting in our quarterback room right now. It's me. When I was in high school, I was a five-star top recruit. Davis Mills, who's our starter right now, five-star, the top quarterback in his class. Jeff Driscoll, five-star, top quarterback in his class. We always talk about an NIL when we were in high school. We don't think that we would have made it out of college. We think it would have changed us. We would have been douchebags. We would have been like uncontrollable at that age, and we wouldn't have been able to <laughs> handle it, essentially. Like, we wouldn't have been able to handle the money at that age. You, have you seen kids – you know, coming into programs looking like that, and do you think that you would have been able to handle it at that age? Um, I think like, let me think. So, I'm trying to think of somebody that would have got offered huge money that, like, I know at a at a very like like a, um, like I know him well enough to know like, oh, that guy is now a doucher that didn't used to be a doucher. Um, I can't think of like I'm sure it can, and I'm sure it has, but. Like, like, just take someone that's three and done, for example. Like, does that money change them once they once they hit their first rookie contract, their first you know twenty million dollar contract? Like, the, you would you would be able to answer that one better than I would. Um, I, I get it. Like, it's eighteen. Like at age eighteen, that's a lot of money to have that you have never seen before. Um, I think there's a lot of guys that go in that are, are the, the guys that are in those positions, like already have somewhat of their mental developed to where. Like they, they understand that it's it's just the first part. At least the guys that I've been around. Let's let's stay there for a second. So, you know, when you get to the NFL, uh, especially your rookie year, JT, you're going to get hammered with um, all the stuff that they make rookies go through, like the NFL Players Association. So, like learning about 
you know, financial literacy and like agents and financial advisors that, you know, because the stats are like whatever it is, 90 something percent of players are broke within like five years of their NFL five career, years. right? Yeah. Whatever it is, right? And people think that I, I think most people think that that's like they're just spending too much money or they have they're getting ripped off by a financial advisor or bad investments. When I think the actual problem is is entitlement it's dudes they they all of a sudden they get a bunch of money to do the same thing they've been doing this whole time for free and the expectations are that i'm really good at football so everything happens for me and i've been i've been a current nfl player former current former current former meaning like i got cut thought i was done four times right so i know the difference like when you're former it's different than when you're current and I see it, honestly, Elite 11 in the Nike opening for years of these dudes just getting everything. And I'm not even talking about money now. I'm just saying, like, they're getting everything done for them. And so all of a sudden you depend on everything's done for me, everything's done for me. You guys are both living in that world right now. And all of a sudden when it's not, when the money cuts off and when everything's not set up for you, I think a lot of people don't even know how to survive in that case. And I can think I was a no-star Started my senior year in high school at Mission Viejo. We were good, but whatever. I had one offer from a small school. And, um, I mean, I still, when I got hurt, I, they drove me to Dr. Legome's office. I went around the back. I never signed paperwork. Everything was done for me. All my teachers were coaches. I kind of just, like, got really good grades. In college, everything was done for me. And so, I, I mean, and then I go to the NFL, and my brother had made a ton of money. So, my family's not relying on me for anything. And I still can't believe some things I spent money on. I still can't believe how dumb I was with money. And I didn't buy a bunch of jewelry or crap like that. I just look at this whole thing and I go, it's money is part of it, but it's the entitlement. And if we're just giving more money to people younger, and I just don't think we're setting them up for success. And I think we're going to see a lot of guys who should have been a lot better than they were. So that's super interesting, Kyle, that you guys are sitting around talking about that. At the same time, though, JT, you, I mean, you've always been such a big Bryce Young fan. Every time you talk about Bryce Young, you say things like, the best I've ever seen, the best player in the country. Like, it's not, you don't talk about him like a buddy. You talk about him like you think he's really unique. Also, a guy, I could see a flip where certain guys who can handle that, I mean, you give them a bunch at an early age, and it actually kind of prepares them for down the road. I think the things that might be easier for Bryce when he gets to the league because of the pressure and magnitude. Do you think it goes both ways, JT? No, I definitely hear what you're saying. I didn't even uh, – I, I never considered the uh, you know, the flip side of that. Um, I would definitely say there's a lot of guys that get paid that have no idea what to do with it, um, and that's nowhere near their fault. You know, it's, it's just like if, you know, if you're never taught something, how would you know it? Um, you know, I, I think that's a – it's an interesting issue that I, you know, hadn't really considered too much about the whole thing. I always looked at it from the side of, you know, I, I think it, it – wh wh who else in, you know, the United States of America is not allowed to make money off of their name, image, or likeness? And I, would like, I don't really know the – I don't know if there is anybody else that is just not allowed to do it. I always – I, I saw it from that way. I said, why couldn't they, um, you know, let, let, let people do it? Uh, if someone wants to pay you money, let them pay you money. Um but yeah, I you know I have never gone through it to the extent that you have, and you know a lot more you know former players. I'm, I'm sure you've seen many examples of the uh, of what they talk about. You know, the five years later now they're broke. How did he lose all his money um, and things like that? So it, it's a lot of interesting things to think of. Mm. Um, all right, you're in Morgantown. Started at SC, went to Georgia. Crazy year last year. Um, West Virginia with big aspirations. Let's go back earlier this year. Um, what was the experience like that recruiting as a transfer this time around? Um, and what made you kind of, what made you pick Morgantown? Yeah. So it's part two uh, of the transfer portal. So I kind of knew what to expect to a certain degree. Um, and n normally when you, when you hit the transfer portal, like your number is uh, in like, like, I don't know how coaches have it, but every coach that looks in the portal has your phone number. So you get, uh, you know, 50 texts, and, you know, usually almost all of them are uh, numbers you don't recognize. And then I got one from Graham, you know, Graham Harrell. And I obviously have the context. I have a former coach. So immediately I was like, oh, like, damn, he's at West Virginia now. 
Like that's a, that immediately moved them up to a spot where, you know, they were in like, it would be hard to knock West Virginia out of, you know, top one, top two, top three. Uh, just because I know Graham, I think is a great schemer. I love the offense uh, and I have a comfort level of playing in it before. Um, so, so immediately once, once I got that text, I was, you know, interested in uh, watching, you know, how, how the offense has progressed over the years uh, and how I felt with it. And then I took an official visit to West Virginia, which was like the second official visit I've ever taken, maybe third, because I did go to, I, I went to Missouri and Oregon State. So actually it was the fourth. This was, I, I didn't take official visits in high school. I took one to USC right before I checked in. Um, so I took an official to West Virginia and I, uh, you know, I got to watch a practice and like the roster is very, very impressive. Like when you watch a lot of the guys that are on the team play football, it's like there's a lot of really good football players here. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. It's it's really cool to hear you go through the transfer portal. I think the transfer portal is such a unique thing in this day and age. It was kind of just coming around as I was, I was getting out of college. And an interesting stat I saw, I don't know if it's true or not, but I saw that a ton of people see the transfer portal and they think it's such a great opportunity. But, I mean, you've been through it. I've been through it. Like, the grass isn't always greener on the other side. I saw some stat that almost 45, 50% of people didn't end up on teams after they entered the transfer portal. Do you know a lot of guys that that's happened to? Yes. Uh, I don't know a lot of guys that have talked to that, but it was way worse in 2018. Um, and it was uh, like with, with with a lot of coaches and at the time I was at USC, um, they talked about the transfer portal. Um, and they said, like, you guys have no idea. Like, there are 2,000 people in the portals or in the transfer portal, and there are 130 uh, Division One football programs, right? So, like, 2,000 people putting themselves in the portal where your scholarship can be taken after the semester you enter your name in the portal. And uh, 130, 130 programs who have, you know, like, a place like, you know, the some of the top and higher-end schools. Like, I know at Georgia, we always had 85 scholarship mm-hmm. guys um, and 25. We signed almost 25 every year. Like, they, like for a lot of top-end programs, like, they have to figure some shit out to get an open scholarship spot to get an open initial. Like, it's like when I actually, when I checked into Georgia in the summer, I wasn't on scholarship. There wasn't a scholarship available until August. So uh, like 2000 people, the places they all want to go are going to have to fight like hell to get it, get an initial for mm-hmm. them. Like there are a lot of people that just end up getting a scholarship pulled and like, what do you do now? Um, I, I, I don't know anyone personally that's gotten like absolutely torched by the portal. But it happens a lot, a lot more than people realize. And at the same point, you're not just competing with guys in the portal. You're competing with recruits out of high school who have four years and do coaches see that they can develop them. And at this point, I think with my experience, when I transferred, there was two schools that were three schools that were seriously interested. It was OU Ohio State and Houston. And I thought, you know, I was a former top recruit. I played a bunch of ball at AM. I played well at times, played bad at some times, but I played well enough. Again, the transfer portal, and you think the grass is going to be greener, and it's not. And I think it's a really interesting thing that people don't really talk about the transfer portal a lot is that kids are getting stuck in there. Kids are not finding new homes, and they're, it's just it's misconstrued out there, in my opinion. But then you get other people like, you get Joe Burrow. There's other guys who have gone through the transfer portal. You know, there's tons of guys in the league who have transferred schools and have have figured it out. I think it can be a good thing. You've kind of been around this for a while. You've been at a couple different schools. I think this is you're going into your fifth year, correct, in college. What do you yeah. think you're going to do this year? How's your preparation different? How's your process different? What do you think you're going to do to set yourself up for a good year this year? And my main preparation has been um, like mechanical and strength perspective injury prevention has been the number one thing. Uh, over the last three years, I've missed more games than I've been healthy for, uh, like by a good margin. I missed 12 of 13 in, or 11 of 13 in 2019. I missed the first seven out of 11 in 2020. And then 2021, I missed eight for injury. And I heard six for six for injury. I started four, missed six, and then they were rolling with stats, so they kept rolling. So, like, the, the number one thing for me has been, like, I got to show that I can stay healthy for a year. Um, so uh, pr- the majority of, like, my focus has been around uh, how can we be mechanically perfect so we're not putting ourselves at risk for non-contact, and how can we strengthen all around the body so that, you know, there's a lower chance of freak injury. That's awesome. I think that's something that I didn't learn until I got to the league. 
that the main, and this was from Ryan Flaherty Jordan, who was our trainer, one of the best trainers that I've ever worked with. His main focus was injury prevention. His main focus was protect your knees from ACLs, build up your hips, build up your ankles, because if you cannot be on the field, they will find your replacement. So I'm really excited for you. I think that's awesome that you're doing that. Yeah, and, and you look at Burrow, didn't work out the first spot, went to the second spot, all the poof, out of nowhere, one crazy year, uh, and he's number one pick. Kenny Pickett, it didn't start off uh, the way it ended. Uh, but then on a high note, he's the first quarterback taken in his draft class. Um, and so here's a class with Bryce and Will Levis and C.J. Stroud and all these guys. And um, it, this is this has got that same kind of vibe to me of uh, everyone's kind of forgotten uh, from a draft perspective about J.T. But when you put the body of work together and then you prove that that year you can stay healthy, um, I think come February, March, this could be very, very interesting. All right, JT, so we got self-scout. All right, we did this with Desmond last week. This is a five-question trivia about yourself, so you should know the answer to these questions. Um, you're a very smart guy. And by the way, Des went three for five, all right? So pressure's on. Three for five. Three for five is good. What Not did great. he miss? He missed a couple. They were tough ones, though. I forgot what he missed, but three for five. It's a good start. These? I think you can do better. So, All right, here's the first question, JT. You and your team are renewing one of the best rivalries in college football, the backyard brawl, Pitt versus West Virginia. In one week after the 11-year hiatus, it'll be the 105th meeting. What year was the first backyard brawl? Oh, this isn't a trivia about me. Oh man, because I think we went over this. Because we, we we've made it like we this is a like like it, it's a big deal. We we love the the backyard yeah, brawl. Yeah, it's a big deal. So it is um, about you. Golly, because um, we even had. We had a whole like presentation. Somebody that's been that's uh, fo- followed it very closely. Um, w- would it be hundred fifth meeting? Eleven year hiatus as well. It'd be like early, like early, early. Not- oh wait, is, so so is it a math question? Was it every no? It's not year? a math question technically, but there is a year that it started. Well, let me break. Let me break out. Let me break out the count. Cal- well, obviously there's a year. Play it clock's started. going, bro. Eleven year hiatus. <laughs> You're gonna delay a game over here. Would it, would it would it be around 1906? Is that your final Ish. answer? That's not bad. That's my That's final. I'll give you one more. It's before that. Before that, 02? No, 1895. 1902. I didn't even know they played football. 1895. 1895. I was gonna say. I was gonna say 1895 because no, I swear I heard that number, but I thought it sounded. I thought it sounded stupid because I was like, they didn't play football in the 1800s. Sounds like a war they had. I do. They never played football. They had like a small yeah. war. All right, Jordan, you get the next one. <laughs> All right. You threw 67 touchdowns for Modern Day High School in the year 2016. Can you name three other quarterbacks in top 10 single season touchdown record book for Modern Day? Okay, so top 10 single season touchdown record at Modern Day. Can you name three? I would guess me, Barkley. Not besides you. Or not, not besides me. So Barkley, yes. Bryce. Yes. Can you name it? Do I get it wrong if I if, if do I get do it? it I'm gonna guess Leinart. No. I'll give you one not more Leinart? guess. Right. It's not Leinart, and it's not Marinovich too. I'll give you. I'll give you. I was. I wasn't gonna Look say at these Tom. names at the school. Um, I didn't even know Todd Marinovich went there. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I want to say Billy Blanton. That's correct. Ooh. That might be all. All right, Billy Blanton. Is it? Was it Billy, Billy Blanton, Scott oh, Lucas, right. and John yes. Flynn? There we go. All right, one for two. Really. One for two. That's good. These are tough questions. I'll give you that one. Yeah. All right, Tommy Brown played high school ball with him. Um, he's playing college football this year too. Are you guys close in high school? Yes. Okay. What is his major this year? What is his major? He just graduated from Bama. Yeah, he graduated. He graduated from ba- from Bama. He's at what Colorado. What was his major at Bama? God, I'm supposed you can to get... It. Let's go do it what, last year. What was his major at Bama? He spent four years there doing it. The, uh, the, the default generic football answer is communications, but I don't want to say communications. God, this is a... Do I think he did something in finance? This is a tough one, too. I'm not going to lie. It yeah. is a tough one? 
That's like it's it's one that you that you wouldn't really guess. Yeah, I can. I'll I'll let you slide with the broad answer if you get it. Can I get a general area? Is it STEM related? No. STEM. No. What's STEM? <laughs> I thought you were talking about medical. <laughs> um. Yeah, and Desmond got Alec good. Pierce's major. He got his Whiteouts major. Yeah. Well, that guy play. He played with him. He yeah, was on the same true. team. You're asking someone I haven't played with in five years. Um, shit, man. Me and Tommy got dinner like two months. Well, the last time I was in California, like two months ago. Um, I did not ask him what his major was, though. Uh, from Alabama. Let's go with uh, something Tommy would do. Modeling. Is that a major? Mm. Is that even a major? No. It's not a major. You sure it's not a major? It's business. Business. I was going to get it's not out of the ordinary. <laughs> Organizational I was leadership say, slash business. Yeah. I was going to say You should have stuck to your guns And then here, you said man. it's something out of the ordinary. You said it was out of the ordinary. Yeah, that might have been, 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 been a mislead. That might have been a mislead. That was a mislead. It was absolutely a mislead. All right. I'll throw you one here. I was going to guess. All right. We're going to throw up a picture here that goes way back. Um. You're a dog guy. We mentioned it on the intro. You are a big fan of uh, Peta Palmer. Big fan yep. of yep. my pug Peta. Today is her birthday. How old is she? Sixteen. Oh, that's a really good guess. She's, is it seventeen? Fifteen. Dang, that's a good guess. I thought you were gonna be way off. Did you think he was gonna be below? Oh, sixteen. I would have guessed twenty. I thought it was. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, she's, she's not going to make it. She's got a chance. She's still kicking. Yeah. She's been kicking for a while. she got a chance. She just doesn't see, she, here, she or smell, or taste. She can't see or hear or smell. Yeah, no. She's living she's life. She's still going. She does, she does smell. She doesn't shedding. process smells, but she does smell. Uh, all right, bonus question here. All right, me and Graham Harrell played college football. Your offensive coordinator at West Virginia, Graham Harrell, is also your offensive coordinator at USC. I mean – for a, a week or two, and then he got hurt and, and, and got tackled from behind and tore your ACL. Um, him and I played college football against each other and went to triple overtime when he was at Texas Tech. Who won that game? Did you? I, I didn't know that. Yeah, we both. Was we there, both. There a I don't know. You'd have to look it up. But there's, we both probably threw for three or four hundred and, and a bunch of. I don't know. Sick. Um, if you're asking, I'm gonna guess uh, the uh, UTEP won that. No, we missed a field goal. Graham oh, got us. Texas Tech. Oh, I know. You asked Texas Tech session, got bro. us. It's it another misleading. No, I'm just getting mislead. misled here. Oh, there's man, no, this there's, is a tough start. Like, like, if I'm asking a question, there's no way I'm asking a question in which I lost. There's no chance. Yeah, but I lost most of the games I played in in college, so then I wouldn't be able to ask some questions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, we'll give you one more. We'll give you one more, more, JT. All right. We'll give you a six question. Since how many, I think you only got one right so far. So you have a deal with Zaxby's, right? You did I have a deal did, with Zaxby's. Yes. Do you like Zaxby's, first of all? I, no, Zaxby's or Cane's? Zaxby's. That's not the question. Zaxby's. Okay, cool. Even, yeah. Oh, yeah. All right, close. so there's four levels of their signature sauce. Can you name the four levels of it? Oh, my God. Oh, uh, I, I, I literally had to say one of them for an ad. Um... No, that's that. That one's gonna be way out. You guys went fucking. I thought this was gonna be like you know, basic <laughs> trivia. This is absurd. <laughs> the Desmond shooting three for five is like a show high. It has uh, to be. It's only been one. It so is. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Through two shows. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he's he's he set he set the bar high with three for five. Would you ask him? There's no way you asked him stuff like that. There's no. There's not a chance. He had. Yeah, it, was a, it was a mixed bag. Mixed bag. We're still sorting through this. No. Yeah, these are these are tough ones. I'm not, I'm not even going to be able to attempt that one because I only had the I only had the regular say the only regular signature. My my order whenever I went was the uh, classic chicken sandwich, mm. and that just comes. That's with a good one. I would go chicken tenders. The four sauces are whippy, tongue torch, nuclear, and insane. I'm sure you've never done the insane before. Insane. I knew. I knew. No, I I had to for a uh, for like a little ad. Yeah. All right, one for six. So insane was the only one I knew. One for six, it's not. It, it could, could be, be worse, worse, that's for sure. Yeah. You could definitely shoot worse than one for six. Um, all right, let's shift over here. This is my favorite part of the show. Um, Two-minute drill. Now, 
in this, it, we're going to ask you to share your journey for two minutes. Um, we'll start the clock on here. You've done it before. I, I love when guys, other people get a chance to hear from their, hear a quarterback say from their own mouth, like, hey, here's what I've been through, the highs and the lows. Um, I'm very, very familiar with your journey and excited for other people to hear it. Um, so we'll go ahead and start this clock. You've got two minutes. You can start wherever you want in the story, but uh, the goal line, so to speak, is uh, where we're presently at right now. All right. Uh, if I were to start, I would start true for like freshman year at modern day. Um, I came, it came in in the summer. I got lucky that Matt McDonald got hurt in the second game, uh, and I went in and played really well for a little while. Sophomore year, I think I continued, you know, relatively the same trajectory. And then junior year, uh, I had a really good team where our like scout team kickoff players, like three of them, start in the SEC right now. Um, so I went from you know about as successful as you could ask for of a high school career. I was uh, in my class at the time. I was the number one ranked quarterback. I decided to skip a year, uh, head to USC a year early. Um, I had, was a Gatorade male athlete of the year. I had known nothing but ups at that point. And then as soon as I get to USC, uh, this is the first time I experienced any sort of down. Uh, my freshman year, I think I'm pretty sure I'm the worst statistical single season passer in the last like 20 years at USC. Um, so I just, you know, I'd thrown straight into the fire, had to learn a lot, learn fast, uh, and I struggled and it was really difficult. Uh, my sophomore year, you know, I, I think, you know, I think we had a really good team. We had a lot of great receivers. We were great up front. Um, and then, you know, for first half of the first game, uh, I think we were looking really good. I had something like 230 yards passing. We were moving the ball. It felt great. And then I'd get hit with the ACL tear. Um, fast forward. Oh, I got 30 seconds left. So uh, fast forward, end up transferring, uh, wind up at Georgia. Uh, thought I was going to come in and be the guy, and I was a scout team quarterback for the first seven weeks, then uh, or first six weeks. Then come week seven, I uh, get my opportunity, and uh, you know I think we capitalized really well. Uh, moving on, so I finished that season, uh, my first season at Georgia, four and zero. Had a great year, uh, a lot going on, and then going into last year, there's not enough time for me to get into it because last year was another big year uh, with a lot of ups and downs. But I think that is a pretty good summary. A long journey, man. It's, it's interesting to try and, and put it yeah, into a, a, a small amount of time like that. But I think nice. from just for me personally, knowing you since I think we met when you were in seventh grade, like we said, and, and it's really cool to sit down and talk to you today and kind of see you on the other side of things, see you growing up, kind of going through those downs like you talked about after only knowing the ups and getting your perspective and, and kind of seeing like the man you've grown into today, because I think that the coolest thing about football and sports is is it teaches you a lot of lessons and it shapes you as a human being if you let it shape you. So it's really cool, man. I haven't talked to you in a while, so it's, it's really cool to hear your voice and kind of hear where you're at, man. I'm, I'm really pumped for you. Yeah, I think our favorite thing about what we're doing here, JT, is the QB room. The room is just like one of the coolest rooms, right? You mentioned all these guys you're still buddies with from Fink back in the day to Jack Sears and then the Georgia guys. And, uh, and so – we're stoked that you're able to come by our room uh, that we're building, and and uh, you know, known you probably more than half your life, and and uh, love watching the direction that you're heading and what you're um, what you're going and chasing. So, thanks a lot for joining us on the room, man. No doubt, man. Kyle, good to see you again. Uh, thanks, guys. Good being here. Well, I mean, we, we mentioned how long we've known JT for. That was awesome. I, I think, Kyle, you can see I, I've been, I've spent a lot of time with JT the last few years, but you get little snippets, um, man, his maturity is just, he's just gotten so much more mature over the years. Um, and it's just grown up before our very eyes. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I, I mean, I'd mentioned to him at the end of the interview, but I think it's, it's so cool to see how these experiences can kind of shape you as a person. And, and like the high school and college years are probably the most formative years of your life. And, you know, me and you both going through these experiences, how much we've changed and learned and had to, to learn in front of so many big crowds. And I think JT is a perfect example of, of having to learn some tough lessons in front of large national crowds. And um, just to, to hear him the way he's speaking and, and how he is and how excited he is for the season of West Virginia, it's, it's incredible, man. I'm really excited for him. Yeah, West Virginia hasn't really been on the scene since Will Greer had, had a run here his last year. I know you know Will. We both know Will. Um, but I think there's big things in store for, um, for West Virginia this year. And it's going to be a team that 
Uh, Big 12, I like their schedule. I like the way it lines up. I like starting off that season. Gets to play against Keaton Slovis, who kind of replaced him when he got hurt um, at USC. There's a lot of storylines there. So that's going to be exciting. Speaking of exciting, speaking of Pitt, next week, uh, preview our guest. None other than the first quarterback selected in this year's draft, Kenny Pickett. You and I have talked about him. Um, you, you, you think he's, uh, got off to a pretty hot start. Yeah. Yeah. I've been super impressed, man. I mean, it was, it was very interesting. This, this whole draft class in general with the quarterbacks, you know, him going late in the first and then no one going for a while and, and just seeing kind of the storylines from, from Steelers training camp. Yeah. When I'm on my Instagram explore page, it's, it's super random. I'm getting all these Steelers Instagram videos from their training camp. I feel like I'm getting a firsthand experience there, but to kind of see him, they had him as the three to start. And if you see him in the preseason games, he's just been nothing but balling out. I think he was like 13 of 15 and led a two minute drive to win in their first game. Uh, the second game, he kind of got in right before the half. He went six of seven, had some great throws, led another touchdown drive. He actually had a touchdown that he threw that got called back and then threw another one right after. Um, just hearing the buzz around him there. They love him there. He's doing great. And for a young quarterback to come in and do that right away is tough. So I'm excited. To, I'm excited to talk to him. Yeah, you got to be confident. You got to be mature to be able to play at that level, especially in that organization, right? Where they just, they're so used to success and greatness. Um, I, I think Pittsburgh Steelers nailed it. And it's great. They got Mitch Trubisky. Mitch Trubisky's going to play really well. If he ends up being the starter, he's going to play well. Mm-hmm. Um, and he can sit and watch. And if they do decide to go with Kenny, he's played a lot of ball. He's a lot older than the typical rookie. He's not a 21 year old who only was in college for three years. So, I think Kenny Pickett right now is in position A. He went to the holy grail of landing spots and just so happens to be that he's from Pittsburgh too. So I, I know him a little bit. I'm excited to dive into that next week and hear more about his experience uh, heading into his rookie year. It'll be fun. Yeah, it's going to be great. All right, that's it. Thanks for episode two. Uh, thanks for tuning in. We're super excited about this. That was a great interview with JT, like we said. Um, go to our socials. Um, we're on Instagram. We're on TikTok. Throw us some comments. Uh, we got Kenny coming on next week. Throw us any comments of what you want to ask him, what you want to see, any future guests that you guys want to see, different segments, whatever you guys got, throw it in there. This is early in the show, so we're going to see all these comments. Um, keep them rolling. Uh, we're excited about where this thing's going. And as always, like we did in our first episode, we always want to end with what we're grateful for in our lives right now. Jordan, you got a lot to be grateful for. What is it this week? Man, I've had a great summer. I got a six-year-old, a three-year-old, and a wife uh, that's pregnant. Um, I'm grateful for school to start back up. Got yeah. these boys a lot. Um, I'm grateful for school to start back up, and they kind of get to the end of summer, and they're like, "You're ready for them to have another person build that structure and that discipline around them." So I drop uh, my little guy off at school today, first day of first grade, um, and then to hearing him come home and get all fired up about it, it makes you realize we just kind of like forget about how school was. You know what I mean? It's all blurred together when we look back on it personally. And then you go through it as a parent. Um, and just like he's so excited about what he's learning. So, I, you know, from dropping him off and my wife crying to picking him up and hearing about how his first day was and all that stuff, uh, a lot of gratitude today. How about you? That's awesome, man. And the, kind of the same light for me right now, it's we're in the dog days of training camp. I think we got four days left. So I am grateful for training camp to be almost over, fifth, fifth year of training camp. I don't know how you felt about training camp. Your training camp sounds experience sounds like you had a different one than me. You were playing golf with your brother half the day, so you really enjoyed training <laughs> camp. My I days did. have been 6.45 to 7.30 for the last month and a half, so I'm grateful for training camp to be back over or to be over. I'm grateful for the season to be starting, to be game planning against different opponents. I always say this about football, the off season. I don't enjoy it as much as some people do. Not the off season being home. I love being home, but the off season practices and all that stuff, I don't enjoy it as much. I really love just diving in and game planning other opponents, coming together as a team and, and testing ourselves on Sunday. So I'm excited for football season. I'm grateful for football season in general to be starting so I can watch a million NFL games too. Yeah, same. Well, thanks so much for watching. Um, and when you, if you made it this far into the episode and you're hanging up with us right now and clicking off, just take a second, think about what you're grateful for too. Kyle, appreciate it, man. Looking forward to next week. Yeah, man. Thanks.